Hey guys, what's going on? Brent here, and today we are reviewing the Rebel from a company called City Bikes. So this is the second bike from City Bikes that I've been able to review. The first was a Predator that uh, just went up recently, and again, this one is the Rebel. This is a folding electric bike, fat tire with a couple of cool upgrade accessories, this front basket here, these steel fenders, a rear cargo rack, and again, fenders back here. So some cool upgrade points to really kind of increase the overall utility and functionality of this bike. However, before I dive into the actual review of this bad boy, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, City Bikes, just the company, my experience with them, because these guys are a direct order only company. And I always want to give a quick kind of overview of you know the potential pros and the potential cons that come along with direct order only, because it is different than shopping at a retailer, right? So the biggest really pro that comes along, I think, with direct order only is that there's going to be a savings in price, generally speaking. So this bike right here runs for $12.99. And again, these, I think these upgrade accessories are $99 for the rear rack and the fender set, and then $49 for this front basket. However, if I were to get this bike at a retail shop, it probably would be quite a bit more just for the base price. You know, they have to cover overhead, employees, um, you know, utilities, all that kind of stuff. So price savings, big pro, obviously. However, there are a couple of potential cons that can come along with direct order only as well. One of the biggest ones that I found is that there can be a difficulty in communicating with the companies. A lot of these companies are based overseas and sometimes there's a little bit of a language barrier. Um, that really wasn't the case too much with Civi Bikes. These guys speak really good English. Um, they speak much better English than I speak any other foreign language, so good on them. Um, communicating with them was pretty easy. They were prompt in responding to my phone calls or answering the phone and responding to my email. So yeah, really good, really good for them. Props for them for that. Uh, pretty decent customer service. Now. Another potential issue that can come along with direct order only is going to be the fit and finish, um, right? Because I have to assemble any electric bike that I get that's direct order only. And of course the same went for this bike. Now fit and finish can be an issue. Sometimes stuff doesn't fit quite right. Sometimes the pieces or the components don't even match what the um, specs were advertised on the company website. That wasn't really the case with Civi bikes. However, um, there was a little bit of issue for me getting the front basket to fit, getting that stuff on, and especially the rear rack. But as far as getting the actual bike assembled without the accessories, that was really easy. It only took me about, I don't know, like 10 minutes from the time that I cut open the box to the time that I actually put the handlebars on, put the seat post in, put the front tire on, pumped up the tires, and this thing was ready to go. Not that difficult, pretty easy, but when it comes to the accessories, there was a little bit um, of trickery that I had to do. So I just want to point a couple of things out real quick just to help with your guys' assembly if you do get um, the steel fenders, um, the front basket, and the rear rack. So first of all, these, these arms right here that attach to the steel fender, these need to go uh, inside the fork when they're installed and it's best to install the fender to this front rack first via this little support bracket right here and then once that assembly is uh, actually set up uh, and there's a video there's actually videos on the city bikes website um, to help kind of illustrate this as well but once that is set up then attach um, you know this part here to the fork and then after that attach the front part here these um, these uh, whatever these are, these support brackets or whatever, support these here to the front wheel, secure everything, and that's kind of the order that I did it in. And then as far as the, the rear rack here, um, it was relatively easy to get to secure it here um, to the bottom of the frame, but getting it to attach here to the back of the frame, I did have some difficulty as you can see, it just didn't quite line up just right. I was able to get one side secured right here. Um, here's a downward shot, but it was just kind of hard to get this lined up. I think if I had somebody else helping me with this, if I had assistance to help pull this up while I threaded the screw, maybe a little bit easier, but all in all, there was some difficulty assembling this, but not that bad. Again, it was just kind of with the accessories. The bike itself is pretty easy. So yeah, I just wanted to cover that real quick. So let's dive into this bike right here. Again, this is the Rebel from Civi Bikes. A lot of these components are going to be the same that I found on the Predator. So like back here with this motor is a 500 watt geared hub motor from Bafang in the back. 80 newton meters of torque. Um, I, I really like the Bafang motors. I've tested quite a few of them now. The 500 watt, the 750, the 1000 watt. I've tested the mid drives and I like them all quite a bit. I find them to be really, really effective. One thing that I do find with these motors is they are kind of 
noisy, at least they're noisier, I think, than some of the, you know, the higher end, like the Bosch and stuff like that. Um, but they do a good job. 500 watts is pretty powerful. Um, it gets this thing up to the top speed of 20 miles per hour pretty easily. 20 miles per hour with the throttle up here, right there, or 20 miles per hour with the internal cadence um, pedal assist, uh, cadence sensing assist right here. So yeah, the motor, it's, it's pretty powerful. Again, 500 watts, I think that's a, that's a good power range for this bike with these big fat tires. Um, you know, because these tires, they are, they're 20 inches tall by four inches wide. And that's great because they do have a lot of air volume in there and that gives them some suspension qualities, which is great because, you know, this is a, um, it's got rigid front forks here in the front and it has no suspension in the rear, no seat post suspension. So this bike is a little stiff, you know, and having these tires, especially when they're aired down, they have a max PSI of 20 and a minimum, minimum PSI of five PSI and airing those down a little bit, it just can make it spongier and, and just a cushier ride. Of course, if I do that, it is going to reduce the efficiency of the tires. It's gonna increase the tire patch, which should give you more traction, which is great for going over, you know, really soggy train. If this was really muddy, that would make that easy, but it does increase the rolling resistance and it kind of, again, like de just decreases the overall efficiency. So. Yeah, that is there. There is that, but overall, I really do like this motor. Um, back here in the back, we have a 13 to 28 tooth spread in the rear cassette, and in the front, we have a 52 tooth chainring. And this setup with the 13 to 28 in the back and a 52 in the front, that feels like the like the perfect gearing ratio for that top speed of 20 miles per hour that, with this thing. When I hit 20 miles per hour, my cadence to just it feels like it's a sweet spot. So I, I like the, the choice that they went with the 52 instead of like a 48 or something like that for the front chain ring here. Something I wanna call out um, back here though is a couple of things. Um, so here's a motor cable. Here is the Shimano Altus derailleur. So first of all, um, I wanna you know give props to, uh, to City Bikes here for kind of upgrading this derailleur from kind of the entry level Shimano tourney to the Shimano Altus, which is the same derailleur that was found on the Predator as well. So again, a lot of the similar components here. So that's that's awesome. Just a little bit higher quality derailleur here. However, there's no steel derailleur guard or steel derailleur cage that kind of comes down and out like this. I see that on a lot of um, kind of these off-road type uh, fat tire electric bikes. And that what that cage does is just kind of helps protect the derailleur and the and the motor the power cable here from from damage in the event of a strike because without that cage if I tip this bike over if it falls or even if I get you know a strike on a rock or a log or something it just it's it gives more chance for this stuff to get damaged right here um, there is a threaded eyelet right here a threaded boss so maybe if I wanted to I could put an aftermarket um, steel derailleur cage on here that's something that might be an option but as it comes out of the box they do not offer that so going over here this is a plastic um, double-sided chain ring guard. So this is cool because because it's double-sided, it's gonna help keep this chain locked into place, right? Um, it's just gonna help keep it nice and secure in there. It's going to make less of a chance for it to pop off towards the inside or the outside. It just keeps it kind of nice and snug. I think it's also important, you know, because this is not this is just a standard chain ring here with the teeth. It's not like a narrow wide tooth pattern to help keep that chain locked on. So having that double-sided is, is a nice little feature. However, it is plastic, so there is more of a chance for this thing to just break. You know, if I do get a strike, again, talking about, you know, potential damage, you know, plastic isn't the most durable. It's lightweight, that's great. However, structurally, not the most sound. These cranks, uh, 170 millimeter cranks. So that's kind of cool that, you know, with this bike here, it's a folding bike, but we have full size cranks, which is which is great because it just kind of gives that, that natural kind of usual feel, you know, when I'm pedaling. And a lot of folding electric bikes with smaller wheels, um, you know, they'll have shorter cranks so they don't get, uh, you know, pedal strikes during turning. But because these are 20 inch tall, you know, really they're more than 20 inches because that extra fat tire, they're almost like 24 inches. Um, they can have, we can have full size cranks on here and it's not gonna be an issue. So that's kind of cool. It just makes pedaling feel better than like on shorter cranks. The, uh, the pedals here are just kind of like no name plastic folding pedals. So to fold them, I just push in and pull down like that. Oh, they are actually VP. Sorry about that guys. Yeah, these are VP pedals. It's kind of hidden right there. These are VP pedals. And then to unfold it, all I have to do is pull up and they snap into place just like that. So, you know, it's not shaving off a whole lot of um, width. However, it does shave off a little bit. And for a bike like this, that's, you know, it's a folding bike. Maybe if I was storing this in 
a garage, in a storage unit, or just trying to fit it in the back seat of my car or something, I appreciate being able to fold up these pedals and just get that, that little extra space saved because that might mean the difference between being able to fit this somewhere and not being able to fit it somewhere. So, you know, kudos to them for that. Um, the fenders here in the back and, and the front, again, these are steel fenders. So steel fenders are great because they are really strong. Um, they're really stiff. They're not going to rattle around as much as aluminum or plastic fenders. However, they are heavier and they can rust if I scratch them all the way through the paint to the ex and ex actually expose the metal. So it's something to keep out for. If I were to scratch this, I would probably seal it up with something just so it didn't start to rust. And now these are steel, but the rear rack right here and the front basket, these are aluminum. So not quite as strong as the steel here. They are gonna be lighter weight. Um, I don't know what the load capacity is of this rear rack or the front basket. I could not find those specs on the website, um, but it does feel pretty beefy to be honest with you. I mean, we've got four attachment points, one on each side right here, one on each side of the frame right here, assuming I'm able to get everything connected here correctly. So if I were to get that all connected, this, this would feel even more stable. And even as it is with just those three points, I mean, I feel like I could put like a, like a passenger on here or something and it would be fine. So. Just, just pointing that out. So the frame itself here, um, this, this bike weighs 60 pounds, right? And that's kind of heavy, uh, even for a folding bike. It's, that's a heavy bike. Um, and there is only one frame size here. It's gonna be this 17 inch frame. Now it's cool. I mean, that's, gonna, that's gonna, going to limit, right? Who can ride this bike comfortably? Some extra tall riders. Maybe some extra short riders might find this frame, it doesn't quite fit them right. But some cool features about this to help compensate for that is this seat post drops really just about all the way to the bottom. And that's great because on some of the folding bikes, they, you know, they, they bottom out almost halfway through and I can't sink them down all the way. So it just reduces the overall minimum saddle height and might help uh, people with shorter end seams to be able to put their feet flat on the ground you know, at a stop, which a lot of people want, which is great. Also to help kind of compensate for that single frame size, this stem is telescoping. So this is at the lowest point, but I can also undo this quick release right here, pull the stem up and get like an extra 180 millimeters of, of height. And that's kind of cool because if I change the height of the stem here, it's going to change the, the reach. So it's going to actually give me more reach if I want to by raising that, that handlebar. One thing to watch out though for with raising the handlebar too much of the stem is that check out what happens to the wires when I do this. So if I raise it all the way, the tires are pretty much taut. And then if I start turning the handlebars, you know, they, there's even more pressure that gets put on them. So that's just something to watch out for because it can pull out some of these connections. It could even damage the wires. So just be careful with raising this thing to the very top. Okay, quick change of scenery. Sorry about that, guys. There's some kids playing basketball back there. Wanted to change locations uh, just so their dribbling wouldn't distract you guys. So this stem here also folds down uh, for when this bike folds up just to make it extra compact. So in order to fold this thing, all I have to do, pull that latch right there, the handlebar swing down. And then if I do want to fold the middle of the bike, well, first let's check out this little uh, the setup right here. This is pretty stout. I also like how it's relatively narrow, um, the the separation right here. So there's not much chance of me getting a knee strike on the side. Don't want to bruise up my knees or get injured. Now the actual locking mechanism to fold this bike up is really quite secure. Um, I've tried almost with all my strength to release this without um, actually popping this button down here. And this thing is just, it's sturdy, man. It is not going anywhere. So even if somehow this thing comes halfway undone while I'm riding, it's really, really unlikely, I think, for it to fully unlock and have this thing collapse while I'm riding. So with that being said, to unlock this, there's a little latch down here. All I have to do is pull this this way, and then with that pulled, release like that, and now this thing is unlocked. I can fold it up. Something that's cool about this too is there is a steel kind of a cage down here which the bike can rest on when it's folded in half. I do want to get rid of this kickstand though. And then once that's done, it's pretty easy to fold. Just swing it this way like this. And that's it. So again, that's what's kind of cool about this is look, this thing will rest upright without assistance, which not all folding electric bikes do. So I do appreciate that. However, it does not come with 
like a bungee or anything really to secure this thing, to secure the frame to itself when it's folded. So it can sway around if I'm trying to pick it up and carry it. So maybe just something to keep in mind. Maybe it might be a good idea to bring your own bungee cord or something like that. To unfold it, it's the same thing, it's just the opposite process. Like this, boom, lock this back up. All I have to do is just push. Oh, and it is stiff. There we go, it is locked now. To lock the handlebars, same thing. Swing them up, bring that latch up, squeeze it, and that's it. Deploy the kickstand, and that is pretty much good to go. So something that's cool about this kickstand too, just real quick, is it is placed at the rear of the bike. So there's no pedal lock, and it is an adjustable link kickstand. I actually increased it a little bit so this bike would be more upright for the video. Going back to this frame again real quick, like I mentioned, it is 60 pounds. There, I always do have a concern of, of the frame collapsing on any heavy duty off-road use on a folding bike. Um, and the same would go for this as well. But like I was saying, I think it is pretty sound and structurally um, strong, that latching mechanism. I also like that there's a couple of gussets here. One in the top of the frame, one big one in the bottom. This top one is cool too because it kind of acts as a handle. I can pick up the bike just from this. Oops like this it makes it easy and it's relatively well balanced surprisingly um, even though the batteries here in the back and the motor picking it up right there probably because it's closer to the saddle um, it's it's a good good grab point there's also another place to grab right here and it's underneath the seat oh i hope you can see it underneath the saddle there's a couple of cutouts some grooves and i can place my hand right here and actually kind of pick up the bike from the saddle which is just awesome a really small little feature but it makes it kind of handy so again, same thing with this front basket, like I was talking about the rear or the rear rack. This is aluminum. Not sure what the weight limit is on this. One thing I do want to point out though about this basket is it's attached to the front fork here. So when I turn the handlebars, the basket turns as well. So anything, any cargo in this thing is more likely to spill out than if it was attached to the frame. Also, if I have a heavy cargo in here, it is going to become pronounced that extra weight while I'm steering. I'm going to feel it more. This is something to keep in mind. Down here though, we've got 160 millimeter mechanical disc brakes in the front and 160 millimeter mechanical disc brakes in the rear right there. Mechanical disc brakes, um, they're easier to adjust than hydraulic disc brakes. Sometimes over time, this cable can kind of stretch out um, and it makes the brakes kind of spongy. To fix that, I can just unscrew this right here, tighten the cable, screw it back up, and it's pretty much good to go. But with mechanical disc brakes, it does take a little bit more effort to, to squeeze the brake levers to apply enough pressure to the brakes to maximize the stopping power. Thankfully, with these brake levers, they are nice and big. You've got that rubberized edge right there, so they're pretty easy to grasp, but it does require quite a bit of strength to really get the maximum braking power out of this compared to, again, hydraulic brakes, where generally it does not require as much pressure. These brake levers are not adjustable as well because they are mechanical. So people with extra small hands or extra large hands might not find the reach quite right for them. Something that's really cool about these brakes though is that they do have motor inhibitors built in. So you've got the brake cable right here and then this electrical cable, that's the motor inhibitor. So whenever I depress the brake lever here, even just a little bit, like about right there, just about like that, it's, it's gonna activate the motor inhibitors and it's going to cut off power to the motor which is awesome because number one, that's going to ensure that I have the shortest possible stopping distance with this bike, which is a great safety feature. And also means I can kind of use the motor inhibitors to kind of manually override the motor when I'm pedaling at slow speeds and trying to tackle obstacles because this bike does have a cadence sensor. It's a 12 magnet cadence sensor built in here to the bottom, it's internal, um, which is great because it just means less chance for kind of dust and kind of gunk to accumulate on it and interfere with it but there's going to be a delay from the time that I start pedaling and the time that I stop pedaling and the time the motor actually spits out power and the motor actually shuts, shuts off respectively. So again, when I'm like navigating um, kind of technical train at low speeds, it's nice to be able to shut off the motor whenever I want to by just slightly depressing the brake lever. So cool feature right there. Speaking of, you know, kind of safety stuff, on this side, we got this throttle, which is live from zero miles per hour here. So you can see that twist there starts to move. So whenever I turn the bike on, this throttle is hot, which is awesome because it means that I can get this bike moving 
from a stop at like a bottom of a hill at a high in a high gear i'm trying to cross a crosswalk really quickly uh, if i don't have a lot of time left or something or for me in particular what i really use that for is assisting the bike upstairs i can do that with this throttle because it is live from zero miles per hour but there does come kind of a safety caveat with that um, and i've done this recently is an accidental activation of the throttle and the bike can get away from you so it's just something to keep in mind with that um, please be careful with that don't want anybody getting hurt by accidentally hitting that throttle right there Let's talk about this battery really quick this is a 48 volt system here 13 amp hour battery 624 watt hours um, same specs as the Predator, different style battery. This is the Silverfish style battery right here. Let's raise this saddle real quick so it gives you a better view. So this is a Silverfish style battery right here. Um, something I do like about this is the keyhole is at the top and the charging port is at the top as well. So what that means is if I wanna charge this thing on the bike, there's less chance of the cables interfering with the cranks as opposed to if this charging port was at the bottom. So just a nice way to help protect the battery overall. However, it is a locking removable battery. So I can take this thing out if I want to. However, to remove this battery, I have to first take out the seat post completely like that, unlock the bike, or unlock the, uh, the battery here. Which way is it to unlock? Is it unlocked? No, that's power. There we go, unlock the battery. And then, once I do that, I can pull this thing out and get it free. That's what the battery looks like. Groove in the back, groove in the front, put it back in. Basically just same thing, just line up the grooves right there, get it in, gently push it down. Don't want it to, oh, see, I didn't actually didn't seat it right. Ooh, there we go. Okay, gently bring it down. I have slammed these before in the past and that's just not a great way to, you know, treat the battery. So, okay, put the seat post back in and then turn this thing on and it is ready to ride. So, yeah, kind of an extra step there to, you know, to release the battery, but you know, it is what it is. Some of the other, some folding bikes, they can have like a seat post um, where the saddle can kind of flip forward. So I don't have to remove this whole seat post to get the battery out, but this one does not have that. But again, back to the saddle real quick. Um, it is actually pretty nice. It's got these rubber bumpers here in the back. Um, really relaxed, kind of comfortable saddle with kind of foam in here. Just a comfy little saddle, I dig it. Range I estimate for this thing, same as a Predator, around 15 to 30 miles. It's going to really depend on how I ride this, how much I weigh, what kind of terrain I'm tackling, how heavy I am on the throttle, what level of pedal assist I'm in. So, you know, when we give these range estimates, Court and I, it's really just a, it is kind of a broad estimate here. And a lot of this is gonna really depend on just individual use. So let's dive in to the control center here. So to power this bike on, I have to do a two-step process. Number one, I have to turn it on with the keys here. Okay, now the thing with this bike, is I do have to keep these keys inserted while it's operating. And one thing I do wanna mention about that is I have found that sometimes I can get like a heel strike, not so much with this bike, um, but I can get heel strikes while pedaling when the keys are left here in these silver, silverfish style batteries. So again, just something to keep in mind because that can't damage the key, it can damage the battery. But once that is turned on, I just have to do a long press on the M button and this bike will come to life right here. Now, whenever I turn this bike on, it is going to revert to pedal assist level one. So if I bring this up to pedal assist level three, turn it off, turn it back on, boom, it's going back to level one. I mean, I would prefer that, you know, these displays have memory, so whatever whatever I leave it in, the settings is going to revert to that. Um, most of them I found though, they don't have that. I'm not really, really sure why, but, that's okay. <laughs> On the top here, we've got a five bar battery indicator, 25% or 20% increments, not super precise. I like the percentage indicator, so I know really exactly how much battery I have left, or at least a, a better estimation than just 20% increments. Um, on the top here, top right, we have the level of pedal assist. It goes from zero, which is dead. So in zero miles per hour, no throttle, no pedal assist, all the way up to pedal assist level five. Really each different pedal assist level kind of gets the same power from the motor. It's just kind of like a speed limiter. So level one kind of tops out at like 10 miles per hour. 
Level two is like 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, stuff like that. Kind of just goes in like small increments. Down here is the current speed. If I tap the M button, it's going to toggle through a couple different display settings here. So I can have a, a tripometer, I can have an odometer, I can have a ride time, I can have the average speed, max speed. If I hit it again, it goes back to the average, or just the regular speed that I have here. If I hold the minus button, that's gonna activate walk mode, which is nice for just kind of, you know, walking this thing beside me, especially up a hill. I could, I could of course, just use, use the throttle though, since this is live, uh, like we were talking about earlier. If I hold the plus button, that's going to turn off and on the backlight on the display here. So you can see it's now off, hopefully. Tap it or hold it again, and it's back on. To get into the settings of this display, I'm going to hold the minus and the plus buttons at the same time. And that gets me into the first level of settings right here, where we have a clear trip, set unit, set double D, set LS, and set voltage. If I want to go deeper into the settings, I can hold the minus and the plus again. And it goes into specific settings. So power settings, current set, assistant number, speed sensor, slow start, backlight setting, and a password. So I can't put a password on here if I do want to um, just kind of you know add another layer of protection to this bike. To get out of there, I'm just gonna hold M and it's going to go back to the main menu right here. Now this display, I really do like it because it's just it's so small and compact. The button pad is integrated into it. It's got tactile feedback, rubberized buttons. It just, it feels nice and it's just out of the way. It doesn't clutter up the handlebars. Um, however, it does not angle and I cannot take it off without tools here. And it does not have a USB type A port. So it's a little limiting. If I want to angle this thing to reduce glare, I just can't really do that. If I want to take it off at a bike rack so it doesn't get scratched, I can't really do that. Not easily. I do need to bring some tools with me. So something to keep in mind, but again, overall, I do like this display right here. It's a pretty cool display. Over here on the right, we do have a little flick bell. I prefer the flick bells that are in the brake cluster right here. I uh, just kind of helps streamline the handlebars, lose more room for accessories like lights, cell phone mounts, Bluetooth speakers, GPS, whatever. Um, but you know, this is fine too. Shimano SIS index thumb shifters here on the top. Something to keep in mind with this is, you know, this is just like an entry level component. Sometimes it's, it might be kind of hard to reach this. Um, again, just for people with smaller hands, it does require kind of a repositioning of the thumb here to, you know, to, to access that while I'm riding. Speaking of lights though, real quick, this bike does not come with front lights or rear lights. Um, and they don't offer any of those, they don't offer any lights on the website, especially with this color here. It comes, this bike comes in matte black and pearl white. So the black, black color, I think it looks great, but with no lights and this kind of, uh, this darker color, it's not going to be visible really in low light conditions. So safety might be an issue there for folks that like me, like to ride in the sunset, kind of get those, those late evening rides. So again, something to keep in mind, might be a good idea to grab some aftermarket lights, throw something on here, throw something on your helmet, maybe get like a helmet with lights on it, stuff like that, just to increase overall visibility. So yeah, guys, that's pretty much it for this bike. Um, fun bike, let's take it for a ride and then we'll do a quick summary. So let's see how this thing performs in action. This first shot is going to be a chest mounted shot. And I'm basically just gonna ride this bike around, another little track uh, close to where I live, take it up a hill, show you guys a little bit of a hill climb, uh, some brake test, stuff like that. This is the backwards facing camera. I'm just basically going to hit that same little hill that I did in the last sequence, um, just so you guys can see it in a, another angle.
And then here's just a good chance to listen for the starting and stopping of the motor when I start and stop pedaling. So you can hear the delay there and I'll also go through the rear cassette a couple of times as well. Alright guys, that is it for the Rebel review from Civi Bikes. A couple of things that I want to talk about real quick before we close out this review. Um, just in summary, you know, I think this is a good bike for people who might have an RV, people with maybe a little bit larger frames themselves because this does have the 20 inch tires, the full size 170 millimeter cranks. Also, it's going to be good for anybody who wants to just have portability in an electric bike but still be able to tackle kind of soggy terrain. Anything like snow, sand, mud, gravel, stuff like that, where these four inch wide tires, especially when they're deflated a little bit, are really going to excel at just floating over that kind of terrain compared to regular size, you know, two inch, 2.1 inch, whatever tires on most bikes. So that's kind of cool. It does also have this added utility of being able to throw stuff in the front basket, being able to have a rear cargo rack, the option to add these fenders. But again, these do not come stock. These are upgrade points. So just something to keep in mind there. Overall, I think this bike is pretty comfortable to ride. It, even though it doesn't have that, it doesn't doesn't have front suspension, no rear suspension, no seat post suspension. Just because of these fat tires, the ride overall is much less stiff than normal bikes with no suspension with the regular size tires. Again, just because of that added air volume, it, it gives it some suspension quality. So, cool bike. Again, this thing runs for $12.99. Hope you guys dug this review. For the full ride up, head over to electricbikereview.com. If you are going out to ride, have fun and of course, ride safe. So have a great day, guys. I will see you next time.